All right. I don't see it. What it's all about, man. Am I live, guys? Hey, okay. It's not coming on. I don't know. It's like frozen, chosen. But uh, I guess David Wood is on. Hater Wood's on too. Hater Wood. What terrible timing. There goes my 200 people. <laughs> We're all live now? Oh, boy. I didn't know that. But I heard that David Wood's video is short. It's going to be a short video. Is it? Someone said it's going to be a short video. Premiering what? Let's see. I'm listening to here. What are they premiering? Well, it says one minute. Okay. I have no idea. Later. Hold on. All right. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I don't know who's going to show up. Yep, 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 friends. What about your friends? Okay, folks. This is the only time I had to live stream today. I mean, I can shut down if you guys want. No, we ain't going nowhere. You guys want me to still teach? We can because I don't like to compete with other brothers when they're live streaming, but that's the thing. I don't know when they live stream. I thought one o'clock, my uh, his time. What's up, sixteen eleven on your way to heaven? Because there's stuff I want to talk about, you know, in Jesus' name, by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, you guys want me to stay? I can stay if you guys are up for it. You want to stick around because I don't think we're gonna have the usual crowd if we have CP and David Wood both live streaming. And that wasn't intention. We're not trying to compete with each other. Hey, Vine, how you doing, brother? Good to see you, Nada. Uh, happy belated Thanksgiving for those of you who do celebrate Thanksgiving. I'm a little tired. I'm a little under the weather, I guess, down. But let's just pray and trust the Holy Spirit to purify me in the blood of Jesus Christ, to cleanse us and wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ and forgive us for succumbing to the flesh, for our hypocrisy to save us from being hypocrites and empower us to be doers of the word in love with Jesus and obey Jesus and truly help us to live the victorious Christian life, purity and holiness and righteousness and love and devotion and obedience to our God, Father, Son, Spirit. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, though we do so imperfectly. We love you and we praise you and we thank you for who you are, the one true God, Yahovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all flesh, the God of all creation. <clears throat> that's who you are, Father. That's who, who you are, Lord Jesus and Holy Spirit. That's who you are. One God, the Father, his eternal Son, his eternal Spirit, inseparable. <clears throat> and that alone makes you worthy of all love and praise and glory and honor. We thank you and we praise you. We love you, Father. <clears throat> We love you, Lord Jesus. We thank you and praise you. We love you and we thank you and praise you, Holy Spirit. Father, please have mercy on us and forgive us for our shortcomings, our imperfections, for succumbing to the flesh. Crucify our flesh, Father. Mortify our flesh and fill us with the Holy Spirit. Fill us with fruit from your Holy Spirit. Life and power and self-control from your Holy Spirit, your eternal spirit, your sovereign, beautiful spirit, the spirit of your Son, the Lord Jesus. And transform us by our spirit to become more like Jesus Christ in holiness, in purity, in righteousness, in self-control, in worship, in love and devotion, Father. To love Jesus Christ even more. May he increase in us, may we decrease. And Father, cleanse us and purify us in the blood of Jesus. And cleanse and purify our loved ones. My angels, my two angels, my girls, cleanse them, wash them with the blood of Jesus. Seal them, seal us by your spirit. Fill us, Father with your presence, with your love. Conform us to the image of your Son, the Lord Jesus, and, and just anoint us by your Spirit, Father, and bless this session, Father. Bless it, Lord. And give me the power to live the Word perfectly, not just to preach it. Give us the power to live your Word, to love your Word, to affirm your Word, and to walk in the victory of the cross of the Lord Jesus, mortifying our flesh, crucifying our flesh, giving us victory over the evil one, 
as the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us, the blood of Jesus, our shield against the evil one, Father. And Father, fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with the breath of life and loosen my tongue to speak truth without error. Save me from confusion and stammering and to recall scriptures perfectly, Father. To bless your people, fill them with wisdom and knowledge and insight, Father. Bless them, Father. Bless them, Lord Jesus. Bless them, Holy Spirit. And save us from attacks of the evil one. Please, Abba, we need you. Uh, you know, we need you. We need you, Lord Jesus. We need you, Holy Spirit. And please fight our battles and give us victory over our battles, my battles, Father. You know what they are. Please help me, Lord, and save me from <clears throat> these attacks, Lord, and give me favor, divine favor with the system, Lord. We need you. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Yahweh, Father, Son, and Spirit. Let's pray that we still get over 100. Okay. If you're wondering why I'm titling this Zechariah, good to see you, Brother Al. The reason why I'm titling it Zechariah made me question Christianity, putting his name in the description. It's because that will attract Muslims to watch these sessions and trusting by the power of the Holy Spirit that they will hear a clear representation articulation of the gospel of truth and by the power of the Holy Spirit fall in love with the true God revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from this wicked false God and his false prophet in Jesus name right and also because I want to take the most common objections raised by Zechariah and his ilk and refute them by the grace of Jesus Christ don't mind my lisp I do have a lisp and sometimes it gets really bad but you know what Zechariah's lisp makes mine Look mild. Yes, the brother asked about Jesus being the only son of God. A brother, if you go to John 17, verse 3, you will see. <laughs> sucker and sucker chat. <laughs> oh, man. Right? Yeah. All right. Anyway, before I begin, I just want to show you again. I, I, I don't say this enough. I don't emphasize this enough. You know who you are. I asked the Lord Jesus. My God, my Savior, my Lord, my love, my life, my creator, my provider, my life giver, my sustainer, my everything, my all in all. Jesus Christ, he is our God, our love, our life. I ask the Lord Jesus, if I have found favor in his sight, his unworthy servant, to bless every one of you richly for praying for me and my daughters, for supporting us and for tuning in and using the material to glorify Christ. And I just want to say again, thank you guys. Those of you who are standing with me prayerfully and financially, you know who you are. The Lord Jesus richly bless you. Again, I would not be able to do ministry <clears throat> and be able to <clears throat> provide for my daily needs and provide for my daughters had it not been for the Lord Jesus moving you to partner with me financially. May he bless you richly for all your your love and support, and I pray that he will just give you an abundance of spiritual <clears throat> blessings. In Jesus' name, Lord Jesus, bless them. They're doing it because they love you, and I want to just thank you. You know who you are. There are many of you I haven't been able to reach out to you personally. Please don't take that pers personally, that I'm not reaching out to you personally. In time, as I get settled and planted by the grace of Jesus Christ, I would like to reach out to every one of you personally via email. And maybe even talk to you on the phone and just thank you from my heart. The Lord Jesus bless you for it. And I love you. Thank you so much. It's because of your support I'm able to make sure that my needs are taken care of, my daughter's needs are taken care of, and that I'm able to do the research I need to do by getting resources for ministry. For example, another thing that I picked up at the Evangelical Theological Society Conference which is also known as the Evangelical Theolo uh, Philosophical Society Conference. I got this book right here, right? And it's the Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue to speak without air. It's called Trinity Without Hierarchy. The reason why I got this book, and guys, again, uh, pray. I have about over 20 boxes of books that I don't have access to anymore because they're in Chicago because I moved. Ask Jesus to give me favor to stay in the state. These boxes are in storage. And many of them are at a Christian center because a pastor who loves the Lord Jesus Christ, a man of integrity who loves me for the sake of the Lord, allowed me to leave my boxes in his Christian center. So my boxes of books 
are miles away in another city, another state, so I don't have access to them. But I picked this up because over the last few years, an intense debate has broken out among evangelical Christian scholars. You see, it says Trinity without hierarchy. You guys see the book, right? Okay. What does that mean? I hope I'm not boring you. Pray the Holy Spirit, anoint the words of my mouth to be a blessing to you. I may not be entertaining, but I want to be educational, trusting the Spirit to guide me to speak truth without error, and then give us the power to live it out for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? Okay, now, there is an intense debate taking place among evangelical scholars whether the Son and the Spirit are eternally subject, eternally subordinate to the Father, what they call relational or functional subordination, meaning though the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are three eternal relationships, what we call three eternal distinct persons, they're not the same person, who are inseparable in that they eternally exist as the one God. They are fully God, truly God, equally God. Is there a hierarchy within the Godhead, within their relationship, in that that the Father is the head of the Godhead and the Son and the Spirit are subject to Him? That's the debate. This book is saying, this book is saying, no. That the Father, Son, Holy Spirit are three eternal relationships, three eternal persons, which we all agree. And there is no authority structure, hierarchy, because Father, Son, Holy Spirit are equal in authority. And the only reason why we find passages in the Bible where the Son is subject to the Father and the Spirit is subject to the Father and Son is because of the roles they assume in accomplishing the redemption of creation. Clear? You understand the debate? Am I confusing you guys? I don't know what you mean, slamming Sam. Just look at that big head. I have no idea what you're talking about. You understand what? Did I confuse you guys? Or do you understand what the debate is? Before creation came into being, when it was just the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Were the Son and the Spirit subject to the Father even before creation? Or were they equal in authority? And the only reason why the Son and the Spirit became subject to the Father is because of the roles they assumed and bringing about the salvation of creation. All right? May the Lord loosen my tongue and the Holy Spirit save me from error. Yeah, I didn't know that David was going to go on my time, and obviously I'm going to lose competing to that guy, even though his stuff is boring as heck. 1611, yes, there's two groups. One group says there was no authority structure within the Godhead before Jesus became flesh and before <clears throat> creation came into being. These are the roles they assumed after creation came into being in bringing about the salvation of creation. The other group says no, even before creation, not to confuse you guys, even before creation, before creation even came into being, the Son and the Spirit were subject to the Father so they call this eternal subordination, relational subordination, functional subordination, even though they are equal in essence, in power, in glory, and majesty. That's the debate. So this book is written to argue that before creation, there was no hierarchy in the Godhead. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit are not just equal in essence, in nature, in glory, in power, in majesty, in worship. They're equal in authority. This is this is what this book is arguing for, right? Now, I don't want to keep talking about books because I want to get into the heart of the matter. Thank you. Thank you for the blessings in Jesus' name. This book I picked up as well, not at the conference a while back. Like I said, the reason why I'm able to do this is because God has put me in full-time ministry and put in your hearts to 
stand with me financially and pray for that continually to come in and the Lord Jesus will sanctify this money and keep it safe from these robbers and agents of the devil that seek to try to destroy me so I can provide for my daughters and myself. Now, this book is called Honoring the Son. You can't see the name of the author, I don't think. Let's see. Okay, it's too far. Yeah. Larry W. Hurtado. Larry W. Hurtado. He just passed away several days ago. Larry Hurtado just passed away a few days ago. I announced it on my Facebook pages. Larry Hurtado was one of the greatest, most influential, evangelical, Trinitarian scholars of the 21st century. He's now entered his everlasting rest. He's with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's in glory. He's now completely whole, pain-free. Yep. He's written a series of excellent books. His magnus opum is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a massive tome where he goes throughout the entire corpus of the New Testament and demonstrates how the earliest Christians, the first Christians who were Jews, started worshiping Jesus alongside of God, in union with God, <clears throat> ascribing to him the cultic reverence that the Old Testament ascribes to Jehovah alone, what he calls a binatarian, right, binatarian shape, of Christian worship. He called it binatarian shape of Christian worship. Why binatarian? Because of the two distinct persons, God and Christ. Now, though he's conservative, he wasn't, how do I say this without dishonoring his memory? He wasn't as conservative as I would like, because though he was a Trinitarian and he'd tell you he believed the Bible was inspired word of God, he didn't believe the Bible was inerrant inerrant meaning without error nor did he believe that all the speeches attributed to jesus in the gospels were uttered by the historical jesus nor did he believe that the historical jesus claimed to be god you with me there yep 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 closed on sunday let me share some with you many of the scholars today who are professing evangelical scholars let me say this again let me shock some of you many Scholars today who claim to be evangelical scholars, and I'm not saying they're not, who tell you the Bible is the Word of God inspired and claim to be conservative and believe in the Trinity, do not believe the Bible is without error, nor do they believe that all the speeches attributed to Jesus Christ were uttered by the historical Jesus. In fact, many scholars, and I'll mention a few names, okay? Daniel Wallace, Mike Lacona, Craig Evans, do not believe that the Gospel of John gives you the actual words of the historical Jesus, but John gives you an inspired interpretation of what Jesus meant. I believe the Bible is not error too. It's for the perfect word of God, preserved by God. I'm just telling you what these scholars believe. Did you know that? Do you understand what I just said or no? Did I confuse you guys? Okay, let me repeat it again. Evangelical scholars who believe the Bible is inspired are Trinitarians, worship Jesus as God, do not believe that in the case, exactly, of the Gospel of John, that you have the actual speeches of Jesus. You with me there? They believe John gives you an inspired interpretation of what Jesus meant, but not what Jesus actually said. So if you ask these scholars, did Jesus actually say, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. They'll say highly unlikely. It's highly unlikely Jesus said that, but John, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, tells you that's what Jesus meant, though he didn't say it. You know that? I'm shocking you guys, right? I'm not shocked because I learned this early on in my apologetic ministry. Yes, 1611. I'm not trying to dis discredit them, attack them, dishonor them. I love these brothers in Christ, right? But what I see happening, what I see happening is the desire 
of academia, evangelical academia, wanting the love, the acceptance and affirmation of the liberal critical academy, and therefore making concessions that they think will make them more endearing and more acceptable to liberal critical scholarship. Did you know that? Are you with me there? So 1611, they'll tell you John's gospel is inspired by the Spirit. So it is God's word, but John is not giving you what the historical Jesus actually said. John is inspired by the Spirit to bring out the meaning of Jesus. And those of you who go to Bible college or seminary, what I'm telling you is what they've taught you, and I'm not lying. And I'm not talking about liberals. I'm talking about evangelical conservatives. That's what they teach in Bible colleges and seminaries. So I thank the Lord I didn't go to Bible college or seminary. In 1611, you're absolutely right. A little leaven will spread, and eventually the evangelical Christians of today, right, sound more like the liberals of 100 years ago, and then if the Lord tarries 100 years from now, our evangelicals will be no different from liberal scholars and what they say, what they write. I don't know if Frank Turek believes that the Gospel of John gives you the inspired meaning of Jesus' words. I haven't asked them, but I wouldn't be surprised. Paul Washer, no. Can I share something with you guys? Can I share something with you guys? Believe it or not, this is a true statement. It is typically the Calvinists, the Reformed Christians, who have the highest view of Scripture and will never tell you that in the Gospel of John, you are getting the meaning of Jesus, but not the words of Jesus. Typically, those Christian scholars who have the highest view of Scripture and defend its absolute reliability and inerrancy happen to be Reformed Christian pastors, theologians, apologists, the Calvinists. For example, you'll never hear James White, you'll never hear James White say, that the gospel of John gives you the meaning of Jesus, but not the words of Jesus. Did you know that? Now I'm going to add another group to this. You know who also will never tell you that, but will defend the historicity of the gospel of John? You know who will defend the historicity of the gospel of John? The independent, King James only, fundamental Baptist like Stephen Anderson. Well, Vine, you're asking me another question that's not directly related. The independent, King James only, fundamental Baptist, fundamentals Baptist, will tell you everything in that Bible is 100% true. And if it tells you this is what Jesus said, he said it. Do you know that? Yep. So this is, this is something that's a fact, not making it up. What I'm telling you is a fact. In fact, I don't want you to believe me. Can you guys do me a favor? If you're on Facebook and you know Daniel Wallace or Mike Lacona, or if you can get their email, contact them. But please, I don't want them to think I'm turning people against them. I love these brothers. I disagree with them. I'm not saying I'm on their level, right? But I'm just stating facts. I'm not lying. Contact them, say, do you believe that in the Gospel of John, we're getting the actual words of the historical Jesus so that Jesus actually said what John claims he said? You know what they'll tell you? No, in the Gospel of John, we're getting more theology, less history, and we're getting John's interpretation of what Jesus meant. Yes, he's a Calvinist close on Sunday, but he does not believe that John gives you in every instance, the actual words of Jesus, but what you have in John is John's interpretation of the meaning of Jesus. Right? That's what they believe. I'm just telling you, don't take my word for it. Now, why did this come up? 
It came up because of Larry W. Hurtado, this book here. An excellent book. Small book, but his magnus, what they call, uh, you know, his magnus opum is Lord Jesus Christ. It's a huge tome where he goes throughout the entire New Testament corpus to show that the first generation of Christians, the Jewish followers of Jesus and their followers after them, all of them started worshiping Jesus immediately in union with God so that their worship was binatarian in shape. And he says this was unheard of, right, unprecedented. Magnus Opus, yep. You got it. But I wanted to say Magnum because I was thinking of Magnum P.I. Magnum P.I., baby. Hold on, let me see. I think of a word. Yeah, Magnus Opus. Hold on, let me see. I love Andrew. Not too much, though. Yep. Magnum opus. I was right. Magnum C. That's what you get for correcting me, you little sinner. Magnum opus. But again, I'm imperfect. I'm being perfected, so I could be I can be wrong. It's Magnus Magnum opus. You see, you little sinner, I was right. You need to face these, brother. Oh, yeah, brother. Okay, hold on. Using technical terms so I can sound educated. <laughs> All right, hold on. Here you go. Let me give you the link. What a sinner. Oh, we're always going to have haters. We're always going to have haters in our midst. Here you go. Magnum Opus. This is his masterpiece. It's called Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, let me get you the link. Unfortunately, it's locked away in my boxes, and I don't have access to it. Here, let me tell you. I just brought this up because of this man, Larry Hurtado, who just went to be with the Lord Jesus several days ago. Right, he just passed away. Okay. This is it, the book right here. Lord Jesus Christ. Superb book. His masterpiece. He proves that the earliest historical data and the entire New Testament corpus testifies that the first now you understand why that's important. Understand the importance of this. The first followers of Jesus were monotheistic Jews, and he demonstrates that the very first generation of believers, Jesus' own followers, and their followers after them, started worshiping Jesus in union with God, offering to him cultic reverence. A cult movement started around him. When we say cult, we're not talking about like cult leaders. and No, no. The word cult is used to mean, in the theological sense, right, and historically, it means the particular religious rites associated with a deity, the cultists surrounding a deity. So when we say cult, we're not talking about cult leaders like Charles Taze Russell. Cult or cultus refers to the religious rites ascribed to a deity by the deity's followers. Are you with me there? Am I confusing you, boring with the details? Are you following me? Right. So he shows that the very first followers of Jesus were Jews, included Jesus within the cult of Yahovah, of Yahweh. They started ascribing to Jesus the very same cultic practices that they would offer to the father of Jesus, Yahovah of the Old Testament. Right, so that book is monumental, but again, let me just be clear though he was conservative evangelical, he didn't believe that everything attributed to the historical Jesus that the historical Jesus said or uttered, he didn't believe the gospel of John gave you the actual words of Jesus, but he gave you the meaning of what Jesus said, John's interpretation of what Jesus meant, what Jesus said, and he didn't believe that the historical Jesus claimed to be God. You with me there? Clear? And so this is why I've said, and I'm going to repeat again, and we go into our discussion. Okay? This is why I said, I'm going to repeat again, do not 
deify scholarship. Do not exalt scholarship. Do not stand in awe of scholarship. Do not be intimidated by scholarship. <clears throat> be true to the scriptures. Be true to your conviction by the Holy Spirit that the Bible you hold is the perfect preserved word of God. And that the speeches attributed to Jesus, the historical Jesus did utter. Now, that's not to say that Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not sum up the words of Jesus, give you the gist of what Jesus said. Because, again, you can see that. That Mark records a saying of Jesus that when it appears in Matthew and Luke, it doesn't appear in the exact same form. Because these writers are taking the words of Jesus, translating them in a target language, and accurately summing up what Jesus said, but not necessarily giving you what he said word for word. But they're not making up speeches. In other words, Jesus did say that, but they're summing up the words of Jesus, giving you the gist of what Jesus said, not simply making up a statement of Jesus, and then someone claiming, well, Jesus didn't say that, but John is giving you what he believes Jesus meant, though he never said those words. You see the difference? There's a difference between saying, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are quoting what Jesus said, but they're summing it up, giving you the gist of what he actually said in opposition to saying, well, no, Jesus didn't say anything remotely close to what John says Jesus said because John is not giving you Jesus' words or even the gist of Jesus' words. He's simply telling you what he believed Jesus meant by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. See the difference? You understand the difference between the two? Southern is like, if you're here with an agenda to talk about what you want to talk about, I'm going to block you. So either listen and focus because you said there's no soul in the Bible. It means you don't know what you're talking about. And now you're talking about people going to hell. I don't know why you're coming in and chiming in with your agenda. Focus on the topic or bye-bye. Hasta la vista. All right. Now, with that said, with that said, this is still a great book nonetheless, and his book, Lord Jesus Christ, is a great book nonetheless, because why? Every one of you must be critical readers and thinkers using the Holy Bible. And here's my particular copy of the King James Bible, which I believe is the perfect word of God, right? It's my own copy. This is the standard of truth. It is infallible. It is without error. It is the very voice of God speaking to the bride of Christ, to the sheep of Christ. And this voice of God will never mislead you. And this is the standard that you use to judge everyone and everything, even scholars, apologists, preachers, and teachers like myself. Right here. Sorry. So get the books, but separate the wheat from the chaff. Get the books, but separate the wheat from the chaff. If someone tells you, well, Jesus didn't say what John records Jesus is saying. John is simply telling you what he believed Jesus meant. You can flush that down the toilet. Send southern Israelite to northern Israel so he can be stoned for saying Sibboleth instead of Shibboleth. Send this dog to his master. You get my point? Is that clear? Everyone clear on that? Because now I want to discuss a topic, a question that was asked. That's the whole point, D-Rock. It is clickbait. I'm baiting in the Muslims to come in because I will be addressing the common passages that Zechariah and other Mohammedan clowns abuse and misuse refute their distortion of scripture and turn it against their prophet to expose Muhammad as an agent of Satan. But right now I want to talk about a question that was brought up. Oh yeah. And I, need, I needed to clarify one thing again. I needed to clarify one thing because I got some emails on this and I want to be clear. I thought I was clear, but again, we're creatures of repetition. We need to hear something over and over again until it becomes second nature. For the record, I need to repeat. I am not Roman Catholic. I'm not Orthodox. I do identify with the Protestant tradition, 
I do identify as an evangelical because I affirm sola scriptura and sola fide. Now, I know many of you don't believe that. That's fine. I'm just trying to set the record straight because people keep thinking that when I affirm a particular doctrine that they are either unaware of or in opposition to because they think that doctrine sounds too much like what Roman Catholics and Orthodox believe, they somehow assume that either I'm compromised, God forbid, I pray I'm not, if I am, may the Spirit convict me and seal me for the glory of Jesus, or I'm on my, my way to Rome and I'm crossing the Tiber. Let me repeat what my goal is in my life, my, me personally, me. Whether you're Catholic, Orthodox, Nestorian, Protestant, you're welcome to this channel. We can agree to disagree. Just don't attack me because I don't want to attack you. Learn what I have to say and separate the wheat from the chaff by the power of the Holy Spirit. But let me set the record straight. What I want to be in my life is a biblicist. I want to understand the Bible as perfectly as possible and then be energized, empowered by the Spirit to live out the truth of the Bible as perfectly as possible which I know on this side of glory is going to be impossible for me to have perfect understanding of Scripture and to live it out perfectly. But that's the goal for every one of us. We strive to be as perfect in understanding of Scripture and strive to live out Scripture as perfectly as possible. Though we will fail, we don't use that as an excuse to fail, but we ask the Holy Spirit to energize us and empower us to illuminate us to understand scripture much better and live it out more perfectly, to love Jesus more perfectly. That's my goal. So if I'm convinced that there's something in the Bible that a Protestant rejects but a Catholic accepts, guess what? I'm going to accept that doctrine in opposition to the Protestant tradition because every major branch of Christianity has traditions, even Protestants. So let me repeat the two previous sessions, my point. In the scriptures, let me repeat this again. In the scriptures, there is no blanket condemnation of images altogether. Meaning, nowhere in the Bible does it say you cannot have an image for any purpose whatsoever. I demonstrated biblically that's not the case. Because God himself commanded Moses, as well as Solomon, to fashion images of cherubim, as well as trees and pomegranates that were all over the walls of the temple. Even fashion, had Moses fashioned a bronze serpent. So images in of themselves are not unbiblical. Okay, can I repeat it again? Images and of themselves are not unbiblical. What is unbiblical, what is idolatry, what is sin, is making an image of a being that you take to be divine, a god or goddess, and then worshiping that being through that image. That's what God condemns. You with me there? That's what God condemns. If I fashion an image of Baal, I fashion an image of Zeus, and I kiss that image, and be, I'm doing it because I'm showing an act of worship to the being that I take to be a god or goddess as represented by that image. That's what God condemns. I also demonstrated in the scriptures... That bowing down to someone, bowing down to someone as an act of reverence and recognition of their status before God, that is not sin. First Chronicles 29, verse 20, Revelation 3, 9, just to mention some of the many passages where David is, quote unquote, worshipped in the same context that Jehovah's worshipped by the Israelites but the Israelites were not worshiping David as a god. They were honoring him because of his status as God's earthly representative sitting on God's earthly throne as king over God's people. Right? 
Everyone with me there? It, we, we get it so far. And I then said, in the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, and I got two links. Please remind me before I end the session to share the links with you, and I'll put it in the description box. Okay. The official position of the Roman Catholic Church is idolatry is a mortal sin. It is blasphemy. You cannot make an image of a deity or worship an image as a deity, as a god or goddess. That is sin. So in the official teaching of Roman Catholicism, they do not view having idols of, let's say, the Blessed Mother of our Lord or angels or the apostles and then showing that image honor, not because they're honoring the image, but honoring the being represented by that image. They don't see that as idolatrous because they're not taking these beings as gods and goddesses worthy of worship that belongs to God alone. That's their official teaching. Now, are there abuses? Are there abuses? No, actually, 6 and 11, same 10 commandments. They just number them differently. The second commandment where it says no idols is actually part of the first commandment, 6 and 11. That's also misinformation. Okay. Now, are there abuses among Catholics where they show excessive veneration bordering on worship idolatry? Of course. Of course. Do you remember what I said? I said that no matter what group you deal with, you're going to deal with individuals who are ignorant of what their own particular tradition teaches and are not faithfully carrying out even the teachings of their particular tradition. And that's not tr just true of Roman Catholicism. That's true of Orthodoxy. That's true of Evangelicals. That's true of Protestants. You with me? Everyone with me there? Understand my point. Does that mean I accept Roman Catholicism in total? Absolutely not. I believe, and I'm not trying to offend you, please. Just like you believe there are false teachings in Protestantism, there's a lot of false teaching in, in Catholicism, and I cannot accept the Pope, especially the current Pope, as the infallible mouthpiece of God. I can't. I don't see in Scripture or in history. That's my conviction. Just like Catholics believe there are a lot of false teaching in Protestantism, well, extend me the same courtesy to also have the same understanding of many of your teachings. Right? You with me there? So can I repeat it one more time? One more time. Are there abuses among professing Catholics, even Orthodox, in their veneration of saints and angels, in their veneration of icons? Of course there is. Even Catholic clergy will admit this. Even Orthodox clergy will admit this, that there are adherents that are excessive in their devotion, boarding on idolatry, and they need to be reined in and told to repent. I made that clear in the previous session. So why are people now emailing me saying, oh, but my relatives, when they, they bow to that statue of Mary, if they're taking her as a goddess. Well, correct them. What I'm trying to say is in the official teaching, the official teaching of, let's say, Roman Catholicism, do they say Mary is a goddess equal to Jesus in his divinity? Worthy of our worship as a goddess and look to her as a goddess. Of course they don't. As Of course they don't. I'll give you the links. And interestingly, as I was researching this topic after the session, lo and behold, Catholic answers use the same arguments I use from Scripture to show that idolatry is not simply having an image or showing reverence to an exalted figure elevated by God. They use the same passages. Even the title co-redemptions. Now, I'm not a Catholic apologist, Boxy, so please don't misunderstand me. I try to give people the benefit of doubt and understand what they mean. Do you know what they mean by co-redemptrix? Do you understand what they mean by co-redemptrix? What they mean is that Mary is a vehicle, a vessel, an instrument 
that God used to bring about the redemption of mankind. Because how does God redeem? Well, he redeems, obviously, in the person of Christ. But for Christ to redeem us, he had to become man. For him to become man, he needed a mother to give birth to him. So this is what they mean by the term. They don't mean that Mary is a goddess. Salvation originates from her, that she shed her blood to save you. She, it means that she shared in the work of redemption to make redemption a reality like we share in the work of redemption by preaching the gospel and getting people saved. So instead of assuming the worst, have them explain what they mean by that title. And then if you disagree, reject it. You get my point? Yeah. Send acts on his merry way because there is no salvation out of the universal church, but it doesn't mean it's the Roman church. Boxy, how can it be heresy? You're still not understanding me. Okay, Boxy, I'm now going to prove you're a heretic. Boxy, in order for Jesus to accomplish our redemption, did he need to become a human being? Did he need to become a human being? Okay. Now, for him to become a human being, did he need at least one parent to give him his human nature, to give birth to him so he can become a human being? You guess so? Okay, so you mean Jesus, if he just appeared out of nowhere as a human being, that would qualify him as a true human being? What do you mean you guess so? See, again, you're showing your dishonesty because you're not answering honestly. Let's try this again, Boxy, before I have to bounce you. For someone who believes in the Bible to give me that answer, that's pitiful and shameful and disgraceful. What do you mean, you guess so? How did he become human then? So I get tired of dealing with people like this. So Jesus was born from Adam. Now you guys wonder why I call some people stupid. And then you wonder why I'm harsh. Only someone who's an idiot and stupid would mention Adam when I'm talking about how did Jesus become human. And you wonder why I get upset? Now, you guys you guys honestly blame me for getting upset at such stupidity and dishonesty, honestly? Yeah. Send this idiot on his merry way because he's telling me that Jesus would have been made from scratch, from the dust, so that he would have no connection with Adam and therefore would not share in the humanity of Adam and his seed to save them. You see how stupid this guy is? And you guys, honestly, are you getting angry at me for being this angry with such stupidity, such dishonesty? It is disgustingly stupid. No, Jim Machine, he just said that God could have created a man from scratch. How would this Christ then make him our brother and how would that make Christ our Redeemer if his humanity was created from scratch and had no connection or union with the rest of us? Send K on his merry way because this is another idiot and stupid as well. If you're an idiot and stupid, I'm going to treat you like a fool. Proverbs 26 verse 5. Send this idiot on his way too. It's the same question, you idiot. How could Jesus redeem us? I said us, human beings, if you didn't become human. Anyway. Folks, I love you guys, but you understand why I get angry? And I get more angry as time goes by. Early on, I was more patient. Because as I get older, I become less patient with stupidity. For a Christian to be so stupid enough to tell me that, oh, Adam, he was created from scratch. So, Je How then can Jesus be our Redeemer if he's not part of us, shares in our humanity, and becomes one of us and part of the same family? In fact, that's Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 to 15. That's the argument of the Bible. Here, let's read it. Hebrews 2, 9 and 15. And you wonder why I get angry and live it and irate? Hebrews 2, 9 and 15. Let's read it. Okay, guys, read with me. 
Read with me. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death, death for every man. Okay? For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things and bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain, the captain of their salvation, perfect through sufferings. Now watch this. For both he that sanctified, Jesus who sanctifies us, and those who are sanctified are all one. You see, we're one. Jesus who sanctifies us and we who are sanctified are one. What do you mean one? For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We are one family, which is why Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers. 12 to 15. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Now notice 14 and 15. 14 and 15. Watch here. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. He became flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Do you see this is the argument of Hebrews? He became our brother by sharing in our humanity to destroy death, to set us free, free from the free of death. If he simply created a human nature from scratch, then he wouldn't be our brother because he wouldn't be part of our family. You said why I got angry and livid at that very stupid response? You understand why I got angry now? And I even made it clear. How can Jesus redeem us if he's not human like us? Oh, well, Adam. Adam, his human nature was created by the fact. So if Jesus' physical body was created from scratch, that means he has no connection to us. You, under, you understand that, right? If the body of Christ was made from scratch, that means he's now a separate human being in a separate class of humanity, distinct from the human beings that he came to redeem. How would he then redeem us? You get my point? This is why I say this channel, these sessions are not for everyone. They're not. Find someone else. God has someone for you. Okay, Chandler Burks, you know I'm going to have to send you on your merry way too, right? If God could simply say a word and redeem us, that means Jesus wasted his life becoming human and suffering hell for you. You need to get out of here too. Get this guy out of here. Do you guys see the level of biblical illiteracy? Couldn't just God say the word? Do I really need to explain why the incarnation was necessary? Brother makes a good point. Brother makes a good point. The sister said, John 15, verse 3. Uh, sister, don't you know that Allah and his messenger, Allah was a little sucker and sucker tash. All right. I hope I made it clear. I hope I made it clear. Biblically, biblically, let me say it again. You cannot quote passages to condemn images, icons. Because the passages you quote are talking about images and icons of beings that people wrongly worship as gods and goddesses and look to them as gods and goddesses. It's number one. Biblically, you cannot condemn veneration of mighty men and women of God or even angelic beings that God has used mightily and exalted their status. Biblically, you can't do it. I'm just being honest, biblically. Are there abuses and excesses in the Catholic tradition, Orthodox tradition? Of course, because anytime you bring in an imperfect, fallen, fallible human being, he or she are, is going to mess things up and not understand what he or she is doing. That's a given. That's a given. 
right? That's a given. Yeah. Let me give you a similar point to those of you who believe in the signs gifts, the spiritual gifts. Now, here's my question. How many of you here believe that the gifts of the Spirit, such as speaking in tongues and interpreting, are still gifts that the Spirit gives to the body of Christ? Put a one if you're one of them. Because I know not everyone believes that. No, Shana, I'm not going to go and repeat the two previous sessions where I spent over three hours explaining. Go back and listen. Don't ask me to repeat something I've already covered. If you're lazy enough, if you're lazy and not go back to the to the archive, that's your problem. Okay. For those of you who believe, you put a one, that the gifts of tongues and interpretation are still active in the church. It's like someone saying, oh, because of all these quacks, these false prosperity gospel preachers, all these users and abusers who, who fake the gifts or misuse the gifts to get rich and fatten their, their bank accounts. You see, that's proof that the gifts don't exist because look at these people who abuse them. What would you say to that? Because that's the same argument that folks like John MacArthur use to condemn the belief that these signs gifts, the spiritual gifts are active for the church today. They say, no, those gifts have been done away with. They were for the first century to establish the church. Church is established. You don't need them anymore. And so here's the proof that those gifts don't exist. Look at these fakes, these quacks. They're not speaking by the Spirit. They're demonic and demonized, proving our point. You see my where, where I'm getting at? Just because you have people abusing, misusing a particular gift doesn't mean that gift isn't active, doesn't mean that gift isn't still something that the Holy Spirit grants to certain Christians just because people abuse that gift or lie and say they have that gift when they don't. Just because you have these extremists who are misusing, abusing these gifts doesn't mean those gifts are not operative today. You see my point? That's the same thing with you telling me, yeah, but my aunt over there, she's worshiping Mary because she's worshiping. Okay, just because she may be worshiping Mary, because she is showing excessive reverence and veneration to Mary, or some theologian did so, that doesn't tell me that in the official position and teaching of this church, they got it wrong. That person's wrong. Those individuals are wrong. Rebuke them, chasten them, tell them to repent. You with me there? You understand the point I'm making? The abuse of something doesn't mean that thing is not biblical. It's not operative for the church. It's not a gift of the grace of the Holy Spirit. You, you see where I'm getting at? And folks, it's going to backfire against you. Let me explain to you. Did you know if you say to some naive, let's say Catholic or Orthodox, the Bible condemns statues altogether. And the Bible condemns asking saints in heaven to pray for you. Now, you may get a person to believe your position because he or she doesn't know the Bible that well. But what do you do with, with a person who left, let's say, the Catholic tradition and Orthodox tradition because of bad arguments, who upon further study and reflection saw another case, another side, that demonstrated that images altogether are not condemned, Veneration of highly exalted individuals used by the Spirit to glorify Christ, that's not condemned. And there's a biblical case to be made that those who are alive in heaven are perfect and alive, and God allows them to be aware of things on earth. You can ask them to pray for you. They see all that and say, well, you lied to me or you misled me because you told me the Bible taught one thing and you were wrong, and I go back to the Catholic Church or the Orthodox Church. And you know what happens all the time? Did you know that? There are literally hundreds, if not thousands, going back to the Catholic Church after leaving it to become evangelical. Did you know that? You guys aware of this? How many of you are aware of this? Yeah, don't believe me. 
do a search, evangelicals converting to Catholicism or even orthodoxy, and former Catholics returning home. Do you know why? Because they matured out of surface level arguments by evangelicals who parrot what their pastors say or apologists say, but don't go deeper into the word and see what the other side has to say and see which position is biblical. Yep, Wally Chobot. Wally Chobot and I were tight friends in the beginning when he left when he left Islam, and he was a diehard anti-Catholic. And now he's a diehard Catholic. So if you're going to keep using surface, shallow arguments against, let's say, veneration of saints or images or communion of saints, then you're going to run into that person who has heard both sides and can make a very strong biblical case as well as historical case. You're wrong. And then guess what? You look like an ignoramus. Is my point clear? So I'm at a point in my journey. See, now known as newly Greek. Again, speaking in ignorance, doesn't know I did about a six-part session explaining what 1 Timothy 2.5 meant and doesn't mean. But again, another ignoramus who chimes in with a passage of the Bible that that person doesn't know, I can turn against them to embarrass them. See what Newly Greek is quoted for Timothy 2.5. You see, this is the patheticism that angers me. He's the only person that's discovered 1 Timothy 2.5. In 2,000 years of church history, no one knew about 1 Timothy 2.5. Newly Greek, thank you for showing us something. With it. Oh my goodness, that's it. I'm going to repay it. The, the brother, he made a good point. He quoted me, first Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And he didn't quote it all in context. He only quoted the part that helped him, one me there. But he didn't quote the first part. The first part said, there's one God. But that part he forgot because it's not in the Bible. Hello, Akbar. Okay. Now, let me repeat again. Let me repeat again. You guys are doing yourselves a disservice by not hearing the other side and seeking the face of the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth and allowing the Bible to say what it says and accept the Bible in all its fullness. Folks, if the Bible, let's say the Bible teaches, just hypothetically, 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 listen to me, hypothetically, the Bible teaches the Pope is the vicar of Christ. If the Bible teaches it, why would you be opposed to it? It doesn't. I'm not saying it does. But if it did, why would you be opposed to it if you say you want to accept whatever the Bible teaches? Are you getting my point? You're claiming to follow the Bible and you want to believe in the Bible. If the Bible teaches it, what's your problem? here. If it's biblical, accept it. Simple as that. That's it. Notice I accept a lot of things that Orthodox Catholic believe, but I'm not a Catholic. I'm not an Orthodox. I'm not. Now, if we got that point, let me go to another issue. Please, let me repeat again. Please, if you love me and respect me, please. Here's why, how you show love and respect. Do not send me emails. Do not send me comments in private. Give me a lengthy post of why there are people who worship Mary and the saints. I know there are people who are excessive in their veneration. I get it. I know. And folks, I used to argue the way you did less than a couple years ago. But I'm being honest when I tell you that when I've asked the Holy Spirit, and I say, Holy Spirit, purify my heart, my motives. You are my teacher. You are my God. And I'm saying this, and I'm praying this right now. I'm praying it, and I hope you can amen, because I want to pray it on your behalf in union with you. Holy Spirit, 
You are our teacher. You are our God, our creator, our life giver, our provider, our maker, our sustainer, our savior, our redeemer, our all in all. And we love you and we adore you with the Father and the Son. We trust you as the perfect teacher to guide us into all truth because that's what Jesus said you'll do. And we know the Lord Jesus cannot lie. He is truth. We trust in you, Holy Spirit. We trust you, Holy Spirit. You are our trust. Guide us into all truth. Save us from our flesh. Save us from sin. Give us the power to know the truth, to live it for the glory of Jesus. And give us the victory to die in the truth, glorifying Christ, conquering Satan, sin, and the world. Please, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Okay? Since I prayed that prayer, the Holy Spirit has been pleased to open my eyes to things that less than a couple years ago I would not accept. But you know what? Now I see it. I said, okay. All right. This is your word. Here. Holy Spirit, this is your word. You are the perfect interpreter of your word. Please. And I'm saying this from my heart. Please, please, I love your word because this is your voice. We love your word because this is your voice. Please show me what your word means and give me the power to live it because I'm not living it. Please help me in Jesus' name. Now, someone's going to have been accuse me of committing idolatry because I kissed the Bible. See, I showed it veneration. See, Sam is an idolater. He kissed the Bible. Ooh. Do you know why I kissed it? Can I tell you why I kissed it? No, no. Can I? Let me tell you why I kissed it. And I'm being moved in my spirit when I say that. Let me tell you why I kissed this Bible. Matthew 22, 31 to 32. Matthew 22, 31 to 32. Let me show you why I kissed the scriptures. Okay. Let me show you. Matthew 22, 31, 32. Guys, let's break it down so you can go into the meat. I hope you're still blessed by what I had to discuss thus far. Guys, read with me. Matthew 22, 31, 32. Newly Greek, if you want to stick around, don't ask me any more questions. Just listen. Please. I don't want to bounce you. Look what our Lord Jesus said about Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, Jesus speaking to the Sadducees. Guys, pay attention. Have you not read? Notice. Have you not read? So they're reading something. That which was spoken unto you by God, saying... I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Did you catch what he just said? Notice what he said. Have you not read? So they're reading. And what did he quote? Exodus 3, verse 6. And he says to the Sadducees, Sadducees, do you know when you read Exodus 3, verse 6, God is saying to you, God is speaking to you. Have you not read what was said by God? What God said to you. Did you catch it? You guys, did you catch it? He's saying when you read Exodus, and he's talking about the scriptures, not just Exodus. When you read the scriptures, that is God speaking to you. God is saying to you what you read. In other words, he's saying, this is the voice of our God. This is the voice of our shepherd. How can I not kiss the voice of my shepherd? That's now inscripturated. How can I not kiss it? How can I not say, I am in love with your voice, my God. I am in love with your voice, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I love your voice. Let your voice guide me and seal me and my daughters for your glory. Please, you are my God. I love you. <clears throat> That's why I kissed it. See? Do you believe Jesus? He said, this is the voice of God. This is the voice of God. When you read, God is speaking. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. This is the voice of the shepherd. Right? You got it now? Why I kissed it? Is that clear? Do you see why? In fact, did you know? Here's what's ironic. In my debate with Chris LaSala, one of which he he, uh, he deleted from his Facebook page because he got humiliated. And and the other debate that we had that he didn't record because he was dishonest. Here goes Hater Wood. Now his voice cringes. 
Only goats hear his voice. But anyway, you know what he said? And he thought this was an attack. And I go, thank you for complimenting me. You know what he said? You know what he said in the debate? He goes, man, dude, it's like you just like to stick with the word of the Bible. You won't diverge. You won't budge. It's got to be in the Bible, and you got to stick with it, and you won't bulge or diverge from it. I go, thank you, man. Praise God from your own mouth. You're testifying. He said it by way of by a way of attacking me that I'm not allowing for freedom for interpretation. He goes, man, you're just all about this book. I, I'm not lying. He said it. You're all about this book. You're going to just stick with the book. You won't diverge from what it says. Thank you, I said. Thank you. You're complimenting me. That's the goal in my life, to stick with this book and live it out. And he thought he was attacking me. Okay, now are we ready? Are we ready to begin with the question? Now, the only people that hear the voice of Haterwood are the goats. Haterwood. Haterwood. All right. Okay. If we're ready, we're ready. Yeah, I actually went easy on Chris LaSala because someone asked me another question. Uh, was I saying that the fathers before Nicaea were not Trinitarian? No, that's not what I said. Someone asked me that question. Let me correct that. Ignatius, Irenaeus, Polycarp, Justin Martyr, Tertullian, they're all Trinitarians. What I said was the way they explained the Trinity wasn't as precise or the way that late, later centuries of Trinitarians would explain it. Chris LaSala was saying something similar to the church fathers before Nicaea. They were saying, he was saying, that Jesus wasn't created from nothing. Jesus came out of the very being of God, so that he was eternally part of God, and the Spirit came out of the being, being of God, so he's eternally part of God. So understand what Chris was saying? He was saying that Jesus, the Son, and the Spirit were always a part of God's being, and then God brought them out of himself to become the Son and the Spirit. Okay? You with, you with me what his point was? Alan, are you a Syrian brother? God bless you. So the way he articulated the Trinity is close to what the fathers said. Because if you read Tertullian, Justin Martyr, let me explain this, guys, real quickly, and I'll do a session. I have articles on it. I'll put the articles in the description box. Justin Martyr, you guys got to listen to me. Justin Martyr, Tertullian believed Jesus wasn't the eternal son. They believe he became the son when as the word of God, the Logos, he existed as the reason in the mind of God. Listen, he was the reason of God in God's mind, the word residing in the reason of God and the reason of God in the mind of God. So he was there in God, within God, as part of God, as the reason of God and the word of God. God then summoned that word out of himself without severing from God to become the agent through whom God created all things. So that act of summoning is what they call the begetting of the son. So Jesus was the word within the mind of God, summoned forth out of God to become the son at that moment to be used to create all things. You with me there? Hebrews 13, 8 will say yes. Jesus Christ from the vantage point of his resurrection is the same yesterday, meaning when he was here, same today and forever. That's not a passage you'll use, Hebrews 13, 8. Eugenio Carmo, if that's heresy, you just condemned many Christians before Nicaea to hell. You're still not getting it, and it's really hurting me that you're not getting it. Let me try this again. Okay. Justin Martyr and Tertullian and others before Nicaea. Try this again. Believe that Jesus is the eternal Logos, 
Because the word logos can be word. It's also where we get the word reason, logic from. Okay, listen to me. Please, please listen to me. Please. I'm tired, man. Honestly, I am. I'm tired because of my own fleshly sins that I struggle with. I'm tired because I ache for my daughters. I love them and I ache for them. I don't have them. I'm tired because I have a legal system after me. And I'm tired because I have hater wood hating on me. Okay. Please listen, guys. Can you listen before you run at the mouth or the fingers? Can you listen? Okay. Can you listen? Listen, please. In Jesus' name, I'm going to lose more weight. The fathers before Nicaea, like Justin Martyr, Tertullian, and many people don't consider Tertullian a church father because he ended up embracing, you know, the Monta Montanist movement, Montanus, follower of Monta Montanus, even though they're still strictly Trinitarian. Anyway, let's put that aside. Montanist. Came a Mon Montanist. Montanist. All right. Listen. They believe Jesus is the eternal word, logos in Greek, where we get reason logic from, in the mind of God. So he's always existed eternally within as part of God. So the Holy Spirit. Okay. So they're not created. They're not part of creation. They are not created. But when God wanted to create, he then summoned the word out of his mind and summoned forth the spirit. And at that act of summoning them, they became personally distinct from God without separating from him. And that act of calling the word out of himself, that act is when he becomes the son right before creation. So they're Trinitarian in that they're saying the word and the spirit are not creatures. They eternally existed within and part of God. And God would reason within himself, meaning have conversation within himself. But then he summoned them forth to become now differentiated from him. At that moment when he summoned them to create all things and they never severed from him. So though it may not be the way you would like to explain the Trinity now, their explanation is not damnable. It's not heretical because they're affirming that all three are eternal. They're uncreated. You with me there? To give you the best example, Shanab, Eve, when Adam was created, was Eve always a part of Adam? It's, it's a limited, temporal, finite example. Okay, let's 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 let me let me explain. When God created Adam, was Eve already in Adam? Okay, this guy's killing me right now. Probably not. I think probably when you're in your mother's womb, you didn't have a brain and you came out brainless. Let me try this again. Was Eve a part of Adam when Adam when God created Adam? Guys, can you send Newly Greek out of this uh, channel? Newly Greek, don't ever come back here. I don't want you here. Send send Newly Greek out of here, please. Do you guys want me to prove to you that Eve was part of Adam? Where did she come out of? Did she come out of the mud? She came out of the dust? She came out of a donkey? You say rib, but actually the Hebrew is side. We say rib, that's fine. But if you read the word in Hebrew, it's the side of man. Okay. If she came out of Adam, that means she was a part of Adam. Common sense, man. You don't need to be Einstein. Even an idiot like David Wood can get it. Even a moron and someone mentally challenged like David Wood can get it. All right? See? And, and Dave is about to get blocked too. Okay, now, if she came out of Adam, that means she was a part of Adam. At no point in time in Adam's existence did Eve not exist as a part of Adam. Then she came out of Adam to become personally distinct, differentiated from him. Do you understand the analogy now?
send this guy, whatever, uh, this Greek guy who thinks he's Greek and intelligent, send him back to Greece, to Mount Athos. Send this guy out of here, this clown. And you wonder why I hate David Wood. Where he is. Okay. Are you with me there? Do you guys understand the analogy? And you know why I use Adam as an ana analogy? Send Acts 17 apologetics to Mount Haterwood. Okay. Okay. Now, do you understand why I use Adam as an analogy? Let me repeat again. Yeah. Dave, Sargon David, the hater is here. Acts 17, that's Haterwood. He's a jealous white dictator. And by the way, yesterday was his birthday, National Turkey Day, because this guy's an oversized butterball, right? So Sargon David, David Wood made mega bucks, buku bucks off of my information. He took all my arguments, my articles, made YouTube videos. He's now blown up. He's got 400,000 subscribers, boring as pits. He's a millionaire and I'm panhandling for scraps. And he comes here and harasses me because he's a hater. Happy birthday, Butterball. But anyway, he's here, Act 17. Okay. Guys, follow with me so I can go into the main session. Follow with me so I can go into the main session. Hey, Sargon, uh, you're a Syrian brother. If you're taking me seriously, then you must be Jilu because Jilus always want to find a reason to hate and beat up someone. David Wood can't live without me. I can't abandon him. As much as I want to get rid of him because he's dead weight, I can't. I'm stuck with him till I die, unfortunately. All right, now, coming back to the issue. Yeah, he's here, actually. He's here. Act 17, apologetics. Hater Wood. Okay, guys, follow with me now. Let's focus because people say, man, that's why I don't come to Tham Shemud's channel. He's always attacking people, making fun of people. But the brother had a good point. The brother said yesterday, Hater Wood, it was his birthday because he's an oversight. Butterball. Allah Akbar. Yes, brother. I agree, and he is very dry because he you eat him without. Oh, I am foaming like my prophet. All right. Yeah, I do a pretty good Zachary Nayak, huh? Halal Hogan meets a Syrian Nayak. Okay. All right. Coming back to the issue. Okay, let's come back to the issue. Listen, okay. At no point in time did Eve not exist as long as Adam existed, right? At no point in time did Eve not exist as long as Adam was in existence, right? Okay. However, she only became personally differentiated, personally distinct from Adam when God brought her out of Adam, right? Are you with me there? Right? So far, are you with me? So I don't lose anyone. Right? Okay. Now, I'm not saying God and Adam are identical. Adam is identical to Adam. The way he exists, the way Eve was fashioned, is identical to the way God exists. Of course, I'm not saying that. I'm giving you simply an example to wrap your mind around what the church fathers were saying. Like Eve was part of Adam, as long as he existed, and then was brought out of Adam to be personally distinct from him, Jesus, the Word, and the Spirit were eternally part of God. So at no point in time did they not exist, because as long as God existed, Jesus as the Word and the Holy Spirit were always part of God. But then he summoned them out of himself to be personally distinct from him when he used them to create all things. That's the analogy. And then some of the fathers would say that even at that point, he was reasoning within himself, meaning God was conversing within himself because he was still having communion with his word and spirit that were within him. So the way they explained it is not the way I'd explain it, and it's not as precise as later centuries, but that doesn't mean they're heretics and they weren't Trinitarians. They were still trying to make sense out of what the Bible teaches that the Father, Son, and Spirit our God, our Jehovah, and eternal, but then still trying to understand how the Son could be begotten and the Spirit proceed. They were doing their best, 
and try and explain that reality. So they were Trinitarians. They were not Arians. They were not heretics. Clear? Everyone getting it? They were doing their best with trying to understand, okay, well, we know the word Jesus is eternal. He's Jehovah. He's uncreated. But then he's begotten of the Father, but he's not created. We know the Spirit is eternal, but he proceeds. Ah, okay. That means before creation, Jesus was the Word within God, and the Spirit was a part of God. And then the Father begat the Word to become his Son when he summoned the Word out of himself to then use him to create all things. Okay, we get it. You get it? Martian thought that Jehovah was a just God, an evil God, and there was a higher God than him. And Jesus came from that higher God to then deliver us from the God of the Old Testament that Martian thought was evil because he's all about justice. So Martian didn't even have the same view. Okay, is that clear? That's why, number one, you cannot condemn these fathers as heretics. Justin Martyr, Tertullian, they were not heretics. Irenaeus, they were not heretics. You cannot label them as Arians. They were not Arians. They were what we call proto-Trinitarians. Okay? They were Trinitarians. They did worship the Trinity, but the way they explained the Trinity wasn't as precise as later centuries. What to be more precise in the way they explained the Trinity in light of heretics like Arius or Sibelians. Sibelianism, modalism. But they were proto-Trinitarians. The Word is eternal. The Spirit is eternal. In fact, Justin Martyr and Tertullian, you know what they said? The Jehovah of hosts of the Psalms, the Jehovah that appeared to Moses and Abraham, that was Jesus Christ. That's what they say in their writings. You with me there? Clear? I don't know why would I explain the eternal word and eternal generation when the son is the word, the word is the son. And if the son is generated, that means the word is. So I have no idea what you're asking me here. No, 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 Vine. Tertullian never claimed to be the incarnation of the Holy Spirit, nor did he claim Montanus was the incarnation of the Holy Spirit. What they believed was that the Holy Spirit continued to give new revelations to their leader, leader Montanus. They were called Montanists. They believed that the revelation did not stop, that revelation was ongoing, and the Holy Spirit continued to reveal new things to their founder, Montanus. That's where Tertullian erred. erred. Right, Vine? No, I can't, because in John 15, 26, it's talking about the economic trinity, that he proceeds from the Father into the world to bring about the fruits of the redemption that Christ accomplished. No, it's not that we're ever going to explain it better, Eugenio. I don't care how much you study the trinity, how in-depth you go into the trinity, You'll never be able to perfectly, adequately explain the Trinity because God, by nature, is beyond comprehension. And we are finite, fallen, corrupted, tainted human beings with corrupt, tainted human minds. So it's like taking the whole body of water of the earth and forcing it in your brain. Can you do that, Eugenio? Can you take the whole body of water, the seas, the ocean river, and fit it in your brain? Let me give a better example. Can you take the entire body of water and put it in a cup, in a bottle? Can you? Can you take that mass of water engulfing the earth and put it in a cup, in a bottle? Well, your brain is that bottle and God is infinitely more than that mass of water. So how will you ever be able to contain all of God in your pea, you know, your pea brain? My pea brain. You hear me there? Let me real quickly run through some passages about God being unlike anything creation. 
beyond comprehension so I can go into the main point. I didn't even get into the main point. Eugenio, I, I really don't understand what your problem is today. You're trying to debate me for some reason. I answered your question, and I think you're not answering, so I will bounce you right after this. I just said, we're never going to stop growing in our understanding of the Trinity, but we won't have perfect, adequate comprehension. It's impossible. So why would you then respond and say, I didn't say to fully understand. When I got your question, I answered the question. And I went beyond your question. Eugenio, honestly, this is not for you. You need to go to Acts 17 because David would dumb things down because he's dumb himself. Eugenio, you need to leave. Send my friend uh, out of here. Bye-bye, Eugenio. God bless you. Keep me in your prayers, but you need to go. Okay. Now, coming back to the issue, coming back to the issue, Job 5, verse 9. Let's re real quickly go beyond, uh, go through these passages. Job 5, verse 9. Job 5, verse 9. Read with me. Exactly, Andrew Martin. Andrew Martin, who's a Christian in heart, who loves Jesus, said, God must be greater than creation. And we can't comprehend creation in all its intricate details. How much less God? Thank you. I don't know, philosopher. I hope I'm healthy, but are you are you wishing death on me? Job 5, verse 9, because I'll lay hands on you if you do. Which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. Job 5, verse 9. One more time. Okay, one more time. Which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvel things without number? Shayna B., my friend, you're going to leave too. What does Walter Martin got to do with what I'm teaching when Walter Martin did not believe that Jesus was eternally the Son? He believed that Jesus only became the Son at the Incarnation. So he distinguished Jesus as the Eternal Word, who then became the Son when he was born of the Blessed Virgin Mary, a position not held historically by Christians throughout the centuries. So, Shana, you need to go. God bless you too. Enjoy Acts 17. That's for you, not this, this class. Send my friend on his merry way. Bye-bye, Shana. Bye-bye. See, people are not don't get it. Do You guys still don't get it. Let me real quickly explain what the late Walter Martin believed. Walter Martin did not believe that Jesus is the eternal son. He believed Jesus is the eternal word and that he only became the son when he was conceived by and born from his blessed mother, the Virgin Mary, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Did you guys know that? Walter Martin went against the traditional historic position of the church and that he not believed that Jesus is the eternal son. He's the eternal word, so he's God Almighty, but not the eternal son. Right? Did you guys understand that's what he believed? Before I move on? That's what he believed, yes. Clear? So I can move on? Yeah, kingdom of the cults, he says it there. He articulates it there. Walter Martin, as great of an apologist he was, did not hold to Jesus being the eternal son. He believed that Jesus is the eternal word who existed eternally as God, but he was the word, not the son, and he became the son at the incarnation. And he was wrong, biblically and historically. Just want to make sure you got it. Job 5, verse 9. Job 5, verse 9. And I'll do it with pleasure. Which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. Did you catch it? The book of Job says God does great things that are unsearchable. Marvelous things without number. Now, question, guys. If the things he does are unsearchable, can we search them out? If he thinks, does things that cannot be numbered, can they be numbered? Okay, so the Bible has already presented to you a God that's beyond comprehension, unlike anything in creation. And the Bible's telling you, as best as you try to comprehend him, you won't be able to. So we won't stop growing in understanding of God, but we will never fully comprehend him because that's humanly impossible. Job 9, verse 10. Job 9, verse 10. So I'm going to give you the biblical basis for these two statements. Let me repeat it again. 
God is unlike anything creation, nothing comparable to him, and he's beyond comprehension. And notice, the Trinity is unlike anything creation, nothing comparable to the Trinity, and the Trinity is beyond comprehension. You get it? Which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. So here, if he does things, does great things beyond, you know, great things past finding out. You can't find them out. Can you find them out? No, you can't. Okay. Job 36, 26. Job 36, 26. Job 36, 26. Behold, God is great, and we, we know him not. Neither can the number of his years be searched out. Can you figure out the numbers of his years? How long he's lived? No. Right? You see the Bible, and it's not just Job. I want to show you every book of the Bible has something to say about God's incomparability. He's incom incomparable, incomparable. And utter uniqueness and transcendence. Nothing like him. He exists in a mode that's different from anything in creation. And he's beyond comprehension. Now notice, there's nothing like the Trinity. Trinity is unlike anything in creation. And it's beyond comprehension. Now, Job 37 verse 5. Philosopher, what makes me crazy aggressive is jerks. Dogs like you that don't shut up. That I need to muzzle. Okay. Job 37, 5. Job 37, 5. God thundereth marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he, which we cannot comprehend. Let me repeat it again. Which we cannot comprehend. But most of us act like we can comprehend. So to ask me, can we fully understand Trinity? No. Will we grow in understanding of, of the Trinity? Of course. Because you'll never stop growing in your understanding of the Trinity, though you'll never be able to comprehend it. Do you see it? Job 37, 5. But they'll say, oh, that's the book of Job. That's the book of Job. Okay, let's go to Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14. Junior, can you do me a favor? Don't mention people like Walter Mar and others. When I'm trying to focus on topics. That's why we get distracted. Isaiah 40, verses 13. Let's read 14 as well. Isaiah 40, 13 and 14. Read. Who hath directed the spirit of Jehovah, meaning guided him, instructed him, or being his counselor hath taught him? With whom did he take counsel? With whom took he counsel? And who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed him, showed to him the way of understanding? Did you guys... Get the rhetorical questions. Did you guys understand the rhetorical questions? Read it again, please. Who hath directed the spirit of Jehovah? Being his counselor, taught him. With whom took he counsel? Who instructed him? What's the answer? No one instructed the spirit of Jehovah. Jehovah. No one guides the spirit of Jehovah. No one can teach the spirit of Jehovah. Because the spirit of Jehovah is incomprehensible, omniscient, he needs no one to teach him or guide him. You guys got it or no? Did you read it? Do you guys catch it or no? No, I don't think you did. You know why I don't think you did? Because this is a passage affirming the omniscience of the Holy Spirit. Notice it's talking about the spirit of Yehovah, Jehovah. So here's a passage that affirms the omniscience of the Spirit of God. Check it again. Isaiah 40, verse 13. That's why I say you didn't catch it. Pay attention. Not just Jehovah, but Jehovah and his Spirit are omniscient. Catch it again. Who hath directed the Spirit of Yehovah, or being his counselor, hath taught him? No one has taught the Spirit because the Spirit is one with Jehovah, distinct from Him, and therefore, like Jehovah, He's omniscient. Bam! There you go. Two divine persons, both of whom are omniscient. Sink it in or no?
Isaiah 40, we're going to read 17 and 18. The key verse is 18, but 17 and 18. Are you guys getting bored with this? I feel like I'm tiring you guys out. Isaiah 40, 17, 18. Read with me. So one means yes, you're getting bored. Sorry about that, Hapsa. I apologize. All nations before him are as nothing. Guys, pay attention to God's view of creation. All nations before him are as nothing. He considers us nothing. They are counted to him less than nothing. We are less than nothing. You think nothing is bad. Less than nothing is even worse. And that's how God views the nations. Less than nothing. They are vanity. Useless. But then read verse 18. To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? What's the answer, folks? To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? What's the answer? Can God be likened to anything in creation? Is there anything like God in creation? Is there any mode of existence that's comparable to the way God exists? Is there? Okay, well, hold on. You're saying no. Then why then do people tell me the Trinity is polytheism because you can't have one being existing in more than one person because in creation, if you're one being, you're one person. But hold on. I just thought that God is unlike anything in creation. So it is true that a being in creation is limited to a single person. But why would that be true of God's being? Just because in creation a being is limited to a single person, why would God's being be limited in the same sense? If God is unlike creation and you can't liken him to anything creation, then why would you argue, well, he can't be one being in three persons, three persons, one being, because in creation a being is limited to a single person. And if you're more than one person, you're more than one being. That's true of creation, but that's not true of God. You get my point? You see how God has already prepared every one of you. Understand why God, all throughout the Bible, repeats like a broken record. Unlike anything creation, no one's my equal. You can't compare me to anyone. Beyond comprehension, you can't fully comprehend because he's preparing you for the revelation of the mystery, of the majesty, of the triunity, and of the God-man. There's nothing like the God-man. One person, two natures. Nothing like one God and three persons. Live with it. This is who God is. This is who Jesus is. Live with it. Don't try to fully comprehend it because you can't. Remy, you're going to be sent on your merry way as well in a minute. Isaiah 40, verses 25, 26. Now, this is going to really bless you in 26. Isaiah 40, 25 to 26. To whom then will ye liken me, or shall I be equal, saith the Holy One? What's the answer? Who is my equal? Who's gonna, who are you going to liken me to? There's no one, nothing that's your equal that you can be likened to. But now notice how amazing God is. 26, lift up your eyes on high. Behold, who hath created these things, that bringeth out their hosts, their stars by number. He calleth them all by names by the greatness of his might. You understand what he just said? You see the stars? There are billions of galaxies, and each galaxy, billions of stars. I created them one by one, and I have a name for every one of them. I know the stars by name because I create them, I own them, and I know their number. Catch it in or no? Did it sink in? Or I think I got you guys sleeping. You guys are asleep. Only a few of you are answering. Come on, we got to get 200 now. You caught it? Psalm 147, verses 4 to 5. Psalm 147, verses 4 to 5. Why would Whisper ask me a question not related to the topic? 
He telleth the number of the stars. He counts the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Did you catch it? He calls the stars by name. He numbers them. He knows how many they are. He knows their names. That's what makes our God so great and his power so great because his understanding is infinite. Psalm 145.3. Psalm 145.3. Great is Jehovah, Yehovah, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. You see, they keep hammering this point. Unsearchable, infinite, beyond comprehension. His ways are unsearchable. His judgments are unsearchable. Nothing like him, no equal, unlike anything. How many times must God repeat himself throughout his word for it to sink in? Don't expect me to be comparable to anything in creation. There's nothing like me, nothing comparable to me, nothing equal to me. I'm beyond your ability to comprehend. And then you say, well, hold on. The Trinity is beyond comprehension, unlike anything creation. I can't accept it. Hello? That's an argument that the Trinity is true. Because if God is beyond comprehension, unlike anything creation, that means his mode of existence is going to be unlike anything creation, beyond comprehension. And that's exactly what you get with the Trinity. Unlike anything creation... Beyond comprehension. Right? Folks sinking in? Sinking in? Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. We're just going to talk about the uniqueness, the incomprehensibility of God. And I'll answer the question about sons of God some other time. Let's just focus on this. I hope it was a good session, and Lord willing, I'll be back on this weekend. Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6. Read this, guys. Exactly, Andrew Martin. He See, this guy's a Christian who loves Jesus. He's going to be with me in heaven. All of us, by the grace of Jesus, will be there because we love Jesus. This is why idolatry is so wrong. Exactly. Because an idol is infinitely less than the true God. And it is an insult to God. I don't know where verse 1 went. This guy just confused the heck out of me. No verse 1. He gave me 3, 2, 3, 4. He didn't give me verse 1. And I paid this guy for nothing. You believe it? He started with 3, Psalm 133, 2, 3, 4, 5. But for some reason, it doesn't like 1. I guess because Allah is 1. To the chief musician, a psalm of David, O Jehovah, thou hast searched me. And known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. You know, when I sit, when I stand, thou understandest my thought afar off, right? Right? You know my thoughts even from your, your transcended throne. Even though you're on your throne, you still know my thoughts, right? Thou compass, compassest, meaning thou encompass me, you surround me. My path and my lying down, you're aware of it. You behold when I lay, where I walk, and you are acquainted with all my ways. You know, every second, every minute, every moment of everything I do, every day till I die. You understand the knowledge of God here? You understand? He knows when I sit. He knows when I stand. He even knows my thoughts as far transcendent his throne is. It's in another dimension separate from the physical creation. He still knows what I'm thinking when I think it. He knows when I lie down. He knows when I walk. He knows where I'm going. He knows where I'm going to go to. Right? Now watch verse 4 to 6. Here's where it's going to blow you away. For there is not a word on my tongue. But, oh, but lo, O oh Jehovah, thou knowest it altogether. You even know the word that's about to come out of my mouth because you th see the thoughts I'm thinking and you see the thoughts I'm forming and the words that I'm going to now speak from the thoughts in my mind. You already know. Thou hast beset me behind and before. You're in front of me. You're behind me. You're all around me. Your hand's upon me. Your power is the one that's 
over me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Let's post verse 6 one more time. Verse 6 one more time. Watch 6. After saying all this about God, notice his now response, his reaction. We are more limited and hindered because of sin there. When we were sinless, we could take in a lot more. And the things we took in prior to sin, we took it in perfectly. In other words, let me explain what I mean. Before sin, whatever we learned, whatever we saw, we understood it perfectly. And we saw things clearly as they are. That doesn't mean we understand all things fully. But now, because of sin, even the thing I see, I don't see it clearly because my perception is tainted, which is why you can have two people see the same thing and interpret it differently. Well, when it says we have the mind of Christ, it means the Spirit is now transforming us to conform to the mind of Christ so that the Spirit makes us think more like Christ, less like the world, less like Satan, less like you know our flesh. You get my point? Psalm 139, verse 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. If God's knowledge of my activities, when I sit, when I stand, where I go, where I'm going to go, even the word on my tongue before it comes out of my, he knows all that. And multiply that by 7 billion human beings. And multiply that by all the animals. He knows what the animals are feeling and thinking and the insects and angels and multiply that across the entire creation. And he knows the name of every star that he made. How many he made. And you think you're going to understand God completely and fully and you're going to find something comparable to God in creation. You think that? Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. Yep, here we go. Here we go, a William Crane crony talking about Molinism and Middle Lodge. You like how these guys like to advertise for their tradition? Here's Dan Wolf. He's a Mullenist, and he wants to throw in middle knowledge. He doesn't know that I don't like people who proselytize because I'm going to block them. Because, see, Mullenism is immediately ipso facto true. So the Calvinist reform understanding of God's knowledge has to be wrong. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, say Jehovah. Notice, my thoughts are not your thoughts. I don't think like you. You don't think like me. That We may be similar in the way we think, but my thoughts are not identical to yours. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your hearts. Uh, your thoughts. So my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways as the heavens are higher than the earth. Folks. What more, what more does God need to say in this book for it to finally sink in? I don't think like you. You don't think like me. You can't think like me. My thoughts are too high for you. The way I do things is not identical to the way you do things. The way I do things is different from the way you do things. So don't try to compare what you do and how you think to the way I do things and the way I think. I'm beyond you. You got it? I'm beyond you. you. Did you catch it? My ways are not your ways. The heavens are higher than the earth. My way. You know what that means? Let me explain what that means. When someone says to you, how can Jesus be begotten of the Father? Because that's what Zakir Naik, Islam's clown, Muhammad's clown, says, uh, brother, what do you mean by beget? Beget means the animal act. Well, there's a lower function of the animal. Because he's parenting Ahmadidat. Notice the moron, what he's assuming. 
that God begets the way animals and humans beget. But wait, God just said, my ways are not your ways. I beget the son, but my act of begetting is unlike the way you creatures beget. So don't you dare assume that I beget the way animals or humans beget. Because my ways are different from your ways. You got it? Did it sink in? My ways are different from your ways. The way I beget the sun is not how animals beget animals or humans beget humans. Because you're finite, temporal, physical creatures bound to time. I am a spiritual being, not bound to time. So the act of begetting is a timeless act, a spiritual act. That doesn't involve time or procreation. Hello. Making sense, everyone vying everyone else? Oh, I forgot. Job 11, 7 to 9. I apologize. We didn't even read Job 11, 7 to 9. Job 11, verses 7 to 9. Hope you guys are being blessed. Job 11, 7 to 9. You're learning the depth of Scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit. No, Nir Tamid. Nir Tamid, I want to ask you not to chime in because you're getting blocked too. No, the Trinity is not like a person, soul, brain, and physical body, because God is not a singular person in three different modes. Please, I just, guys, did I just waste 20 minutes of my time on this person? Because the person just gave an analogy that he thinks is like God, that actually destroys the Trinity and affirms modalism. Did I just waste my time on her? Do you see what this? You see what this person just did? I just spent twenty minutes hammering the point. And what does this person do? Not only give an analogy, but a wrong analogy that likens God to a human being that's a single person arguing for modalism. Job 11, 7 to 9. Job 11, verses 7 to 9. No, Jay, not even a trinity. Jay, he described modalism. The belief that God is a single person in three different modes, manifestations, appearances. Job 11, 7 to 9. Read with me. Canst thou by searching find out God? Rhetorical question. No, you can't. Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? No, you can't. It is as high as heaven. What canst thou know? What canst thou do? It's high, as high as heaven. Can you reach heaven? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? Can you plumb the depths of hell? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Do you catch it? You can't plumb God beyond your ability. Job 11. 33, Job 11, 33. We'll read all the way to 36, but the key verse is 33. Job 11, 33, 36, but the key verse is 33. Watch here. You didn't know what either, Bill. Yeah, that's, that's actually a large segment of quote-unquote Christianity. It's called Oneness Christians, United Pentecostal Churches. They call themselves Oneness. They're known as modalists. They are your, what's that famous speaker? I had a debate, Bill Shepard. If you go on Acts 17 Apologetics, I had a debate, Trinity in the Old Testament, Trinity in the New Testament with a Oneness pastor. T.D. Jakes is a Oneness. They believe it's one person of God the Father, and he assumes different modes, manifestations, and that Jesus is the human nature of the Father, so that Jesus is the Father in the flesh. The Trinity, they say, is paganism. It's idolatry. And this was an ancient view of the church condemned by church fathers like Tertullian. Irony of ironies. Okay. Romans 11, 33, 36. 
Who's confusing modalism with Molinism? Jumping like a monkey. You, me? You're accusing me of that? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I know what Molinism is. Molinism is middle knowledge. God has knowledge of counterfactuals. Right? Romans 11, 33, 36. Let's read this. Read with me. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Let it sink in. May the Holy Spirit etch these passages in your hearts and minds to believe them and affirm them. How unsearchable are his judgments? Can you search them out? No. And his ways past finding out. Can you find them? No. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or hath given first, or who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him. Who does God owe? Is God a debtor to anyone? Does he owe anyone anything? Has someone given to God that God now is his debtor? Is God a debtor to anyone? No. Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. God is a debtor to no one, because no one can give God, making God his or her debtor. Everything you have comes from God. The life you have comes from God. The food you have come from God. The raiment you have come from He gives all creation everything. He needs nothing, and no one can give him anything. That's why he needs to be glorified. You catch why he breaks down in praise? He breaks down in praise, right? Philippians 4, verse 7. Philippians 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth, all understanding, uh, understanding. Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Question, folks. If a single attribute of God, God has many attributes, one of which is peace. If the peace of God is beyond our understanding, one attribute of God is beyond understanding, how much more God in his fullness totality will he be beyond comprehension? If an attribute of God is beyond understanding, what attribute? How much more God in all his fullness, in his totality, will be beyond our ability to comprehend? You got it? Did it sink in or no? Then Black Betty, I'll come, I'll kick you in your mouth, bust your teeth, lay hands on you, put you in a coma, hoping that science will revive you and plastic surgery will cure you of your ugliness. What happens when you die and you face Jesus and you damns you to hell? Send this idiot on his way. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. And by the way, it's, I'm joking, YouTube, I won't hurt anyone unless they threaten my life and I'll protect my loved ones and myself. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. And we're done. That's it for tonight. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Now watch here. That ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend. Now notice the paradoxical nature of a statement. This is a paradox. Because he says... His prayer is by the Spirit, you may be able to comprehend with all the saints, that all the saints together will comprehend what is the breadth, length, depth, height, right? And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. Paul, hold on. How do you want me to comprehend the love of Christ, which passes all knowledge, to understand its breadth, its length, its depth, its height. When you just told me the love of Christ is beyond knowledge. Beyond our ability to know completely and perfectly. He goes, I know that, but that's why you should strive anyway. Strive to know the love of Christ for you. Strive to grow in the love of Christ for you. 
The love that Christ has for you is beyond understanding. You can't comprehend it. So I have no doubt he loves you with a love that's infinite that you won't comprehend and grow in knowing and trusting in that love, hoping in that love, clinging to that love, a love that will never, never abandon you. That drove him to become flesh, drove him to the cross, drove him to drink the cup of wrath, drove him to be bound to a physical body, beaten to a bloody pulp, whipped to the point of death, nailed by spikes on a cross, then raising that body immortal, indestructible, and being bound to that physical body, being bound to a second nature forever because of this love that is beyond understanding. It's his love for you that did this. That's what Paul is saying. <clears throat> so he's saying, comprehend it. Grow in your understanding of it. Grow in your trust of it. Grow in your, in your love of it and your hope for it. Grow in it and know this love is beyond comprehension. And Jesus has flooded you in his love and preserved you in his love. A love that's beyond understanding. A love that's all powerful because it's the love of the all powerful son. And may the Lord Jesus drown us, drown my shrines of horror, drown us, drown my shrines of horror, drown us in his infinite love and secure us in his love. Please, Lord Jesus, please seal us in your infinite love and seal my daughters in your love. Please, Lord Jesus, we love you. Father, Son, Spirit, in Jesus' name. Right? So what's the point? If the love of Christ is beyond understanding, how much more Christ in all his fullness, in his totality, is beyond understanding. Let me repeat again. If this, the simple attribute of Jesus' love for us is beyond understanding, surpasses all knowledge, how much more is Jesus in all his fullness, in his totality, beyond human comprehension? Right? So again, we pray, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, please, Father, please, Lord Jesus, please, Holy Spirit, forgive us when we fail. Help me not to fail. Help us not to fail. And please, by the power of Spirit, purifying my motives, that will be from my heart, crying to you on behalf of everyone here who will listen, and my daughters, my angels, I love them, but you love them more. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, drown us in your love. Flood us in your love. Seal us by your love, your all-powerful love, O oh Father, O oh Lord Jesus, O oh Holy Spirit, the one God. We love you. We are in love with you and seal us by your love. Cover us by the blood of Jesus, our shield. Shield us. Shield me against this system by the blood of Jesus, the love of Christ. And seal us by your spirit. And my daughters, Lord, love them, bless them, seal them. Bring them to me. We need you and provide for us, please. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Yahovah, Rapha. Yahovah, Rapha. Yahovah, Rapha. Our healer. We love you in Jesus' name. Okay, guys, you need to go back, listen to this again, hit the like button, subscribe, because this entire session is going to be important because this is what I want for every one of you to do. Hear these verses over and over again until by the power of the Holy Spirit they become second nature and then teach it to others because from this moment on, I don't want to hear. It's what I don't want to hear. Yeah, but the Trinity is beyond comprehension. There's nothing like the Trinity. We just got done reading verse after verse after verse after verse. God is unlike anything creation. Nothing comparable to him, comparable to him. Nothing equal to him. Beyond our ability to comprehend, to understand, to know completely. We can know him truly and be in love with him as he's in love with us, but he's beyond comprehension. And guess what, folks? The Trinity, beyond comprehension, unlike anything in creation. What greater proof that the Trinity must be a true revelation of the true God than the fact that it meets the biblical criteria? What's the biblical criteria? Beyond comprehension, unlike anything in creation. Most importantly, it's anchored in the scriptures, right? Let me leave you with this true story. 
true story. Pray for me and my daughters. Pray for divine favor that I stay here planted, favor with the courts, that God will destroy this debt, this satan satanic debt that I do not owe to save me from it, Lord. Bless me financially. Pray for the sport come in to keep doing ministry, to be holy, to get healthy and be healthy, and see my daughters and kiss them and love them to be Jesus. Then please pray. Please pray. Okay, now, let me leave you with a true story. Years ago, this is when I was a, a, an up-and-coming apologist. True story. Okay, up-and-coming apologist. There was a brother going to seminary in Trinity Divinity Evangelical Seminary in, in Deerfield, Illinois. It's like 2000, 2001. He was meeting with Muslims in a mosque in Detroit, a small mosque every month, and the Muslims were cremating them. True story. Let me leave you with this true story. The Muslims were cremating them. So he told me, he told me, would you come and do a session on the Trinity? Now, this is what I had been in the ministry for about a couple of years, maybe 2000, 2001, a year or two. So I wasn't as known, and answering Islam wasn't as known, right? Wasn't as known. Okay. By the grace of the triumph God, it was decimation. It was on the Trinity, decimation. There was a Ahmadidat wannabe who was pairing Ahmadidat's arguments and glory to the triumph God. I was prepared. They got decimated. They were, there was a couple who converted to Islam, husband and wife. They got so rocked, they were shaken. They started doubting their decision on why they became Muslim. God showed up miraculously. Now, guess what happened? One of the professors who's a Muslim asked me a question. Guys, pay attention to this. Okay, you guys are listening? I truly believe that couple came back to Jesus. I don't know because I lost contact with them. Because after the debate, guess what they did? They stopped the meetings. That was the last meeting. After the debate, they told the Christians, no more meetings here. Because they got rocked. All glory to the triune God. All glory to the triune God. Now, he asked me a question. Guys, you're going to love this. When the Holy Spirit shows up and gives you wisdom, what did Jesus say? Do not think beforehand what you'll say, because the Spirit of your Father will give you words to say. Man. Okay, he asked me a question. Watch here. You know, there are third world countries. I'm giving you the gist of this question. Like Aborigines, they know that God is one. Only one God. They don't need to be taught it, because it's instinctive. But you won't find in any of these cultures... A belief in the Trinity. Listen to his argument. A belief in the Trinity. But you'll find them believing there's one God. See? So where did the Trinity come from? Now, guys, get ready. Are you ready? You ready for the answer? And the Spirit gave me that wisdom right there for the glory of Jesus. I go, so let me just get this right. Let me understand what you're saying. Man can discover that there's one God, right? Yes. Yes. But no man has been able to discover the Trinity on his own. Yes. So man can, can't come up with the Trinity. Yes. So where did the Trinity come from if man can, can't come up with it? I wish there was a camera on his face. If you saw the horrid shock on his face, he was smiling. He went. So where did the Trinity come from if man cannot come up with it? I go, thank you for proving the Trinity is a revelation of the true God. I go, so what's your next question? <laughs> is our God beautiful or what? Forgive me if I have offended you. I don't want to offend you. Pray the Lord will save me from my imperfections. Sanctify me to become more like Jesus and sacrifice more of my life to serve you for his sake and love Jesus even unto death and pray for my trials that I am free and this is behind me and go to a higher level. I can't wait to show my daughters on camera again, kissing them and hugging them. In Jesus' name, that will happen sooner than later. And that debt of this judge will be removed in Jesus' name and he rebuke and chasten that dog. For the glory of Christ. Lord willing, I'll try to see you tomorrow if I can. I'll let you know because it's the weekend. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahovah to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come Lord Jesus. Wash us by your blood. Flood us in your love. My daughters as well. And keep us safe from the evil one and from our own flesh. Christ is risen, risen indeed.